No, I, I really don't think so. Um, at the outset, when people first hear about it, they think, oh my goodness, what's the church coming to, you know? But then uh, they hear it, and uh, they're very enthusiastic. Uh, old line Episcopalians, uh, you know, the type that came over in the Mayflower, Mayflower they're, they're wild about it, they really are. All right, Father, I'm going to ask your wife, Caroline, to join you, and uh, I would like you to give us a rendition of the the Mass as you will perform it at St. Stephen's. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten. This is Father Ian Mitchell, who with his wife Caroline are in Pittsburgh to present a series of unusual events in liturgical music. They will sing the communion liturgy at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in the new folk music style mass. Father Mitchell created the folk music movement now used in both Roman Catholic and Episcopal churches throughout the country. Father, what inspired you to create this new folk music movement in the church? Well, I was in seminary and uh, this was in 1958 and the folk music thing was getting rather big in the U.S. And uh, I had studied quite a bit of music, and I felt that uh, the folk music style was very much, very similar to uh, plain song. Folk song and plain song seemed to be in the same bag together. And uh, so I did it experimentally, mm -hmm. without any idea that it would ever be done in churches or uh, that anybody would be particularly interested. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, this is certainly a trend these days, and I can see where it creates a closer unity with the younger generation, but uh, doesn't it uh, also promote sort of a foreign environment to the older people? Father Ian Mitchell and his wife Caroline have created a new folk music style being used in both the Roman Catholic and Episcopal churches. It will appear at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in McKeesport this Sunday. All right. Final tribute is being paid today to Pennsylvania's most famous soldier and the Commonwealth's wartime governor. Edward Martin, former governor, senator, and commander, died in this Washington community on Sunday at the age of 87. The military service and public life occupied virtually the entire career of the man who preferred to be called general. His political career equally matched that of his record in the army, and he held claim to two distinct accomplishments. Although he served in three, he never fought in a losing war. And although he was a vital part of politics for 50 years, he never lost an election. 
The former governor's long and illustrious political career took him from local politics in his native Greene County to the governorship and 12 years in the U.S. Senate. Mr. Martin liked to visit Pittsburgh and marveled at the developments which spread the city's fame. As a public official, he could point with pride to Pittsburgh's Point State Park and Gateway Center, both originated in his administration, along with the idea for the Penn Lincoln Parkway. The Martins moved to Washington, Pennsylvania in 1922. Surviving are his widow, Charity Scott Martin, who was unable to attend the funeral today because of ill health. There are two children, Edward Martin Jr. and Mrs. Mary Murphy. Governor Raymond Schaefer led a large delegation of state officials attending the funeral. Also in attendance, Mayor Joseph Barr, George Bloom, former state Republican chairman, George Tabor, Secretary of Internal Affairs, Senator Hugh Scott, Craig Truax, Secretary of the Commonwealth, and former governors James Duff and John Fine. The pallbearers are all active members of the 28th Infantry Division, the same division Major General Martin trained for service in World War II. Today, a final salute for the former governor, senator, and commander. A military funeral with full military honors. The cortege will now proceed 28 mile distance from Washington to Waynesburg, where Senator Martin will be buried in the family plot in Greenmont Cemetery. Today, a final salute with full military honors for the former governor, senator, and commander, Edward Martin. When today's meeting ended, the school board members left the room still perplexed by the dissension that interrupted the slated agenda. Today was the day that the board was to meet to formally approve the appointment of Dr. Lewis Kishkunis as superintendent of public schools. The resolution was read by school board president, Mrs. Maxine Aaron, and immediately strong opposition was voiced by Lawrence Moncrief, a member of the board. My amendment really was that we, instead of appointing him permanently, we appoint him act, as acting superintendent at this time and conduct a search for a qualified superintendent. I'm not very happy that it had to go this way, that three members uh, chose to um, abstain from voting, but I respect their right to do so and I respect their reasons for doing so. I have been assured by all three that uh, they're in my corner personally and that they'll be working with me along these constructive lines. Do you think this is an indication of any problems that you may face in the future? I don't think so. I, uh, I sincerely hope not. The fact remains this is the first time there has been a disagreement among board members. As one board member told me, these things are usually ironed out in private and they're not brought before the public. And what happened here today is merely an effort on someone's part to break down the system. This is Eleanor Shano for Channel 4 News. Pittsburgh had 6,900 fires in 1968. People lost their lives and property damage ran into the millions. Now, this report concerns not the Holocaust itself, but the story behind it. How do fires start? Chief Keller has seen it all. I asked him if I could join him at the scene of Tuesday night's fire to discuss arson and how it's uncovered. 
Now, where did this fire start? The fire started back in around the meat counter, as you can see here, and you can see your twisted girders above where you know there was intense heat, and this is where the fire or origin, as we call it. Another thing that we can look at is the debris. In other words, this piece of wood, you will see, is pretty well charred. If you notice this planking, which we call alligatoring, notice the alligatoring of the wood, you can tell the degree of heat that was applied to this particular piece of wood. These are things that we pick up in our investigating to go back to the source of the fire. How soon do you begin your investigation? The investigating begins as soon as you come on the scene, taking a physical picture of what you're combating, the intensity of the fire, the smoke. You can tell by the degree of heat in smoke. You can tell by the flames. If it's a volatile liquid, you can tell by the heat of the smoke, uh, burning nostrils, and this is through an experienced fireman. And then, of course, when the investigators come, the chief officers will sit down in a, a group and talk about different aspects of the fire, the degree of heat, and so on, what conditions you had, did you have to make a forcible entry into the building, was the windows broken, was the doors out, and so on and so forth. And all these things add to an investigation. When we call for bomb and arson, everybody thinks it's bomb or it's definitely arson. But this is our squad or of experienced men who come out and investigate the fire, and naturally we go from there. In Belgium, the village spa became famous for one thing, a mineral spring. People drank from it and found it good. Now, over the holidays in the United States, people drank a lot of other things and found them good, perhaps a little too good, which brings us back to spa. Now, throughout the country, health clubs are springing up like excess pounds. Pittsburgh has at least 10 establishments where, for a fee, the over-endowed can be pounded, pushed, stretched, steamed, broiled, and boiled back into shape. Whether it's the current youth craze or just another product of our affluent society, there's no doubt about it, the martini bopper special has replaced the blue plate in this land of abundance, and the overabundant need a place to get lost. Because of the popularity of such health clubs and the yearning desire for the feminine curve and masculine lean, proprietors of such places are living off the fat of the land. There's no togetherness at the spa. Men and women alternate days, perhaps because some individuals feel like a couple by themselves. Admittedly, it's square today to make New Year's resolutions, but a lot of squares still do. And here their resolve isn't being broken, it's just bending a lot. These days we've been hearing much about the haves and have-nots. Now meet the third force, the have a little too much. Why did you join a health club? I joined the health club to be thinner and healthier. Do you feel better? Oh yes, much better. How many hours a week do you spend here? About uh, 16. 
Have you lost any weight? Oh, yes, I did. I lost 30 pounds. After the holiday splurge, the weeks of joyful slogans and throwing caution to the wind via fruitcake and wassail bowl, a lot of Pittsburghers who feel they got too high, wide, and handsome, well, anyway, wide, are trying to get back on the straight and narrow. In this day of the sit-in, laugh-in, love-in, there are still those concerned about the weigh-in, a tense moment for the world, the evaluation of the pound. Now, if the real you is hard to find beneath that facade of flesh and think-thin campaigns never worked, the professional shape makers are just waiting to take over. After all, Thomas Jefferson once said, not less than two hours a day should be spent on exercise. Last week, Richard Nixon's physician ordered more exercise. So these days, the health club fad is as fashionable as the flu. Perhaps we have finally brought to TV that vast wasteland we've been hearing so much about. This is Eleanor Shano reporting for Four Star News. About 250 students gathered peacefully on the lawn in front of the Cathedral of Learning for an outdoor rally sponsored by the University of Pittsburgh chapter of SDS. The main speaker was Rennie Davis, a founder of SDS and one of eight persons indicted by the federal government on charges growing out of demonstrations at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago last August. 
Well, Strom Thurmond was the uh, man who wrote the bill that will essentially outlaw uh, speech that uh, talks about social change in America. Uh, I'm not being charged with any act, any criminal act. Uh, no one is saying that I threw a, bro a brick or, or, uh, or hit anybody or committed any uh, illegal act. What they're saying is that it was my intention to urge people to come to Democratic Convention and to have a demonstration against the war. I think that the problem, though, is to, uh, is to focus on the, the young people and the black people in this country that are trying to get together to stop this violence. And I think it's tragic that uh, more and more policemen now are being used against uh, American citizens to suppress their right to assemble and to demonstrate. We see it in Berkeley, we see it in Columbia, we see it in Chicago. And uh, I think that uh, it's uh, very important that people speak out against uh, the use, the increasing use of official violence, whether it's uh, in the United States or in Vietnam. Mr. Davis told the group, quote, our defense is to be on the offense, and he invited the students to join the conspiracy. His trial is set for September 24th in Chicago's federal court. This is Eleanor Shano reporting for Channel 4 News. This is the yard where four-year-old Dottie and her five-year-old brother George were playing when they were abducted yesterday afternoon. Mrs. Mildred Pembroke, a neighbor, took care of the children. I asked her to describe what happened. Well, the children were playing right there on the swings, and I heard the dog barking, and I came out to see what was wrong, and she was grabbing the children and pulling them up through the yard, and I came out the door, and I uh, caught her, and I uh, tangled with her there for a while, and then she reached in her purse and she pulled out this gun, and she told me they were her children. She used some foul language, and uh, the little girl ran in the bedroom and hid, and then she took me in the house at the point of a gun at my head, and she took the little girl out of the bedroom, and then she ran up uh, through the minister's yard with them and got in a car they had hid up there. I have tried to make a home for them. I've tried to be mother and father, take them to church and Sunday school. I, I just tried so hard to do the right thing. But why my daughter would turn the way she did and turn against me is so far beyond me. I can't understand it. We have no idea their whereabouts at the present time. All I can say is anyone who knows their whereabouts have seen these children by the picture shown tonight. If they would please call the Irwin Police Department or see that the mother, grandmother is notified, I certainly would appreciate it because these children were taken with no extra clothes and I don't feel that they're getting the proper care and my heart aches for the grandmother and all the friends in this community. This is Eleanor Shano reporting for Channel 4 News. Six hundred eleventh grade students at Carrick High School listened today to the personal experiences of two former narcotic addicts. Twenty-one-year-old Angel Perez, a representative of the Teen Challenge program, explained what it's like to be hooked on drugs. And so I started going up to Hayden Ashbury. Up there I seen kids six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. I smoked marijuana with them. I saw them take LSD and shoot heroin. It was a common thing up there. They had LSD for breakfast, marijuana for lunch, and heroin for supper. This was the, this was the thing. I mean, this was the way the, 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 the people brought their kids up. And I could see the hatred and I could see all the distress in their faces. I've seen all of this. And this is the things that people don't tell you when you get started on drugs. And I trust that through our talk today that you might get enlightened and that you will not indulge in these things because I tell you once you get hung up you're hung up for life thank you how long has it been since you've been off drugs uh, at least nine months the longest ever and it, it's what's beautiful about it is that I've gone back to my neighborhood and my friends are, are shooting drugs they're smoking pot and it doesn't move me anymore you see the reason for that is not that I can go back if I if I want to but is that I found something better something that that satisfies something that's real I, you know, I thought about trying it. You know, a lot of kids in health class thought about trying it the way uh, they talked about it and that. But uh, forget it now. According to Rogan Perez, the purpose of these high school meetings is so the teens won't be able to say, I was curious, I didn't know what it was like. 
They tell it like it is, and the picture they paint isn't a pretty one. This is Eleanor Shano reporting from Carrick High School for Channel 4 News. Where are you from? Uh, Center College in Kentucky. Now, did you come down here with parental permission? Yes, I sure did. <laughs> uh, where are you staying? I'm just in a hotel down here on the beach. Okay. You had no trouble uh, convincing your parents that this was the place that you should spend your Easter vacation? Well, everybody comes down here and they realize that the cops, you know, keep things pretty well under supervision. And they realize, it. <laughs> no, they realize it's all right. They think it's all right. Yeah, I think it's pretty good. Because, I mean, nothing it's really a change from college. It's Nobody gets hurt. Something to get, to get out. Why do you think everyone comes comes to Fort Lauderdale? That's a place to Because there's the beach, and a lot of kids don't live up north or want to get away from the snow. And, I don't know, Fort Lauderdale just has the dances, and just it just provides a place for all the kids to have a good time. And the movie where the, the movie where the boys are helped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of the boys feel that the ratio down here is 30 to 1. What do you girls think? You mean boys to girls? Yes, it's great. <laughs> no, 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 no. They, they meant uh, 30 to 1, uh, 30 girls to 1. Oh, no. no, they're more boys. No, they're more boys to girls. It's great for the girls. It's great for the girls. That's the way it is. I, th I think the boys want more girls to come. I think. But I guess some of the parents just don't let them. <laughs> Well, because this is the place to meet. This is where the guys come to meet the girls. Like I said, this is where to go. This is where the boys are, like they say. Uh, you're from Cleveland. How did you get down here? Well, we had five boys in the car. Four of them went to Nassau, and uh, we came here, or I came here. Do you have a place to stay? Well, I wanted to rent a room when I got down here, but the motel accommodations were all full. So right now I don't, but the police have, uh, I've talked to a couple policemen, they're very kind down here. And they said that the parking lot is open to all the students who cannot find a room. So you're sleeping in your car in the parking lot? Correct. Who finances this trip? I do. <laughs> what else do you want? I do. <laughs> uh, John, what about these riots? Uh, they, they're certainly not over any any big issue, or not over any issue at all. What do you think causes the riots? Well, yesterday, and it proves it today, I think curiosity causes it because, well, today, after our big riot, well, almost near riot yesterday, um, <laughs> the people heard a siren going along the street, so everybody just rushed to the side of the street. And this is the same thing that happened yesterday. Uh, just a few people started running when somebody said riot. You know, somebody was getting around and said riot. A few people ran over to the side of the street, more and more and more, and then the light changed. Then everybody went to the center of the street. They thought this is a riot. So, you know, it was a lot of fun. So they sat down. <laughs> what is the ratio of boys to girls? I would say about <laughs> 10, 10 to 1. I would say about 10 to 1. And when there's an optimist back here, he says 30 to 1. <laughs> uh, where are you from? Johnstown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> where do you go to school? I go to, well, I don't go to Penn State. I go to Greater Pittsburgh uh, College here in Johnstown. Now, why did you come down? For the action. <laughs> why do you think, why do you think everybody comes down here to Fort Lauderdale? Well, I'll tell you, we were, we were up there in uh, Daytona about a week and a half ago. No, we were up there uh, four days ago. We are up there for a week and a half. Last year it was great, but since they banned the beer on the beach, it's nothing now. They went down to Fort Myers, we were down there for about two hours, and there was nothing there at all, so we came, to, we came down here about an hour later. Well, the, the pirates were in Fort Myers. Right, but I mean, I can understand why the pirates go there now, I always wondered. Uh, why do the pirates go there? 
I mean, it's kind of dead. I mean, it, you know, they want that peace and quiet, rest, peace and quiet, and that's it.